afternoon, everybody. Um, so, uh, a few announcements. Uh, there's a homework that you can submit on Canvas by Wednesday before class starts. It should be quiz at the start of class um, here on Wednesday. Um, I'm nearly done grading all of the exams on Gradescope. He, I just emailed out, um, and it's also posted on Canvas in the same place as the exam topics and the practice exam and all of that. It's all together there with the key now for the actual exam and a blank copy of the actual exam, too, if you want that. Um, by tonight, I will finish grading those and publish them, publish the grades on Gradescope. Um, and then, uh, um, actually, Mauricio back there has um, exam reflection assignments. Can you pass those out right now? Um, those are going to be due on Monday. Um, it's similar to what you did for exam one, uh, just you know, summarizing the time you spent studying, what you did to your time on. Um, there's a couple differences, one of which is asking you to think back about the plan you made after exam one and think about whether or not you stuck to that and whether or not it worked. Um, and then any additional changes you uh, hope to make. Um, so that's all due on Monday. This Wednesday, in addition to the homework being due and the quiz, um, also if everyone can bring a point, anything with heads and a tails on it to class. Um, then we're going to do some uh, some evolution demos in class, essentially. And we need to be able to randomly select the um, any, Are you raising your hand? Do you need any questions about anything else? Um, if, if, you, if you don't get the exam reflection in the next couple minutes, you can raise your hand and Mauricio will uh, bring that around. Um, so for today, um, I moved to the bottom. There was one topic that we didn't get to about mistakes in meiosis on Friday, um, but because that's not on the homework, it's not on the quiz, um, we're going uh, to um, skip over it or just put it at the end. Um, and instead today, talk about um, uh, some sort of some of the core features of evolution, in particular evolution by natural selection and evolution by sexual selection. Um, uh, so just in general, thinking about a little frequency over time in evolution, what that means, um, and then talking about natural selection, talking about sexual selection, talking about um, how natural and sexual selection can interact with each other. So that's where the plan for you. Any questions about any of the logistics stuff or going on on the material for today? All right, so, um, uh, so if you remember, um, our definition of evolution was just, um, an evolution is just a change in a real frequency over time. Um, and I apologize if you can't quite see that quarter of the board. All says evolution is defined as a change in a real frequency over time. Um, and then a list of, you know, a real frequency, and yeah, selection, 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 so on the plan for today. Um, so, uh, we're going to start out a brand new population thinking about this gene for being able to chase that bitter be, uh, phenol carbon by paper. Um, and we have two people in our population, um, and those are their genotypes. Um, so, um, the first question is, what is the allele frequency in our population? When we do this, we're not, we're not looking at people, we're looking at alleles. We're looking at the versions of the genes that are present and what frequency they're present at in our population. Um, so let's take like 10 seconds, make a guess with your neighbor about what you think the allele frequency is, and then we'll come back and talk about it. It's pretty easy. That's why it's 10 seconds. All right, anyone want to share what they came up with? Sure, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we can say, um, so 50% of the alleles in our population are this, 50% of the alleles in our population are that. Okay, now, these two people are going to have a thousand kids. Um, and so, um, if they have a thousand kids, um, what are now the genotype frequencies of those kids going to be? Um, so let's take like a minute and a half, work that out with whoever's around you, um, figure out, so of those thousand kids, what are the expected genotypes? One's male, one's female. 
Okay, so um, anyone want to share what they came up with for this? Or what they expect the, the um, frequency of different genotypes is going to be? Sure, yeah. And, um, and so, how did you get that? The square, the kind of square, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. And so we have four possibilities that are equally likely. Um, essentially, um, when the male goes to make sperm, every sperm by a coin flip either gets the big T or the little T allele. Um, every egg that the female makes gets a big T or the little T allele. These are independent coin flips. And so the probability of two coins landing heads simultaneously is 25%. Um, one heads and one tails with the male giving heads and the female, give, female getting heads on the coin and the female getting tails on the coin and the female getting heads on the coin and the male getting tails on the coin and then the female getting tails and the male getting tails on the coin all come out to uh, this sort of ratio or, or one quarter, one quarter, one quarter. And since these are the same, that's half of our population. Okay. So far, so good. Um, next question is, um, has evolution occurred between these two generations? <laughs> so um, for this one, let's take like three, four minutes Talk with whoever's around you. Think about the definition of evolution, which is a change in allele frequency over time. Think about our allele frequencies in the original generation and our allele frequencies in the next generation, um, and whether or not the frequency of alleles has changed. <laughs> No, you don't need to write this down. Just make just come over here. Just, just. So we have a thousand people, but how many alleles does that mean? Each person has two, so how many? Two thousand alleles in our population. Um, so we have here, these 250 people between them have how many big teams? 500, right? They each have, so, so we have um, our big T's are going to be 500, for, they come from our homozygous dominant plus 500 big T's come from the heterozygotes, right? Make sense? All right. Um, so I guess a big, yeah, big T's, 500 plus 500, 1,000. And then the little T's, same thing. And so out of our 2,000 alleles in our population, what fraction of them are big T? 50%. Right, cool. What fraction of little T? All right, next. Is that a change in a little frequency from the first generation? No. No. Great. Cool. Awesome. So that is, so no, the evolution has not occurred here. We have um, maintained our allele frequency. Our population has changed some. Um, but, bless you, um, but that doesn't change our allele frequency. <coughs> um, we could uh, have some uh, uh, meteor hit from, hit from outer space. And after the meteor hits from outer space, um, we're left with one individual 
with big T, big T, and one individual, little t, little t, and that meteor also hasn't caused any evolution, right? We're still at 50-50 on our, on our, um, uh, on our allele frequencies. Um, the next generation, everybody's going to be heterozygous. After that, if the, if the generations are large, then we'll get, again, around this, this quarter, half, quarter, next. Any questions about that? Okay, so, <coughs> um, if we keep this, if, if we don't have a meteor hit, and we've got this population of a thousand people, um, and nobody's bringing around um, paper to their dates with each other to see who can taste and who can't, um, and there's no bitter tasting poison in the water or something like that that provides any evolutionary advantage for these, uh, for these people. Um, so, um, so we have random mating, or at least random mating with respect to that. Um, uh, maybe not like complete random mating uh, on all fronts, but um, but anyway, random mating with respect to this with respect to this allele, um, and uh, and no. Um, and no survival advantage for either genotype, for any of the genotypes, for any of our three genotypes. Um, so, <coughs> um, what would you predict? I guess two questions. So, first of all, um, and we'll say the population stays large and so on. Um, uh, what is going to be the allele frequency um, if you come back in five generations. Um, and second, um, if you come back in five generations, if the population has grown to, let's say, 10,000 people, what are going to be the, the various mix um, the various uh, uh, mix of genotypes? So, what are the individuals going to be? How many how many of these thousand people are big T big T? How many are big T little T? And so on and so forth. So, um, yeah. So, go ahead and talk with your neighbors. Think about that for a minute. This one you should write down on a piece of paper with everybody's name on it. Um, so. Um, uh, what do you think the frequency is going to be come back five generations later? And in that five generations later, the population is growing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that's what you think is likely to be happening. Yeah. 
Okay, so um, so what? Did any, anyone want to share what they what their group kind of guess was what's going to happen here five generations later? Yeah. Okay. Any? Yeah. Why? So I think you read ahead in the chapter in the book, right? No? No? Okay, okay. Um, well, yeah, so if you read ahead the section about evolution, they talk about what's the party Weinberg equilibrium, which we're actually going to return to um, probably on Friday after the quiz and everything. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, so essentially there's no, there, these meet all, uh, um, a lot of the conditions are all the conditions of what's called the party Weinberg equilibrium. Um, and that, and, and if, essentially, if there's no advantage to one, one allele or another, um, in either in terms of either mating advantage or um, or survival advantage, um, if we're assuming that mutations are really really rare, which is one gene over five generations with a few thousand people, basically there aren't going to be any mutations at all, um, and uh, uh, at least not in the germ line. There'll be some somatic, some 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 mutations in somebody's tongue somewhere in like one or two cells that can't taste, but not to get passed on. Um, so, uh, and, and nobody, and we don't have like a whole bunch of, um, of people who can't taste all leaving the population, or a whole bunch of people who can't taste all coming into the population, or anything like that. Um, so, so basically, our allele frequency shouldn't change, right? There's no reason for our allele frequency to change. Does that kind of make intuitive sense? Um, we'll, we'll do it a little bit more um, systematically um, uh, on Friday. We'll talk about this a little bit more systematically and mathematically on Friday. But for now, if, if, not, if there's no reason for the alleles to start changing frequency, they're just going to stay at the same frequency in our population. It's sort of the, 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 the basic um, uh, um, uh, concept here. Does that make sense? Um, and so coming back, looking at our 1,000 people and looking at their genotypes, anyone, anyone want to share what their group came up with in terms of what the genotypes of those 1,000 people would be? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, we thought they would say no, all less exactly the same. So, uh, if, the, if the population is still like 50, 50 for alleles, then they're kind of like, it should be the same way in that comes where. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, sometimes we'll have big T, big T mating with other big T, big T, but just as often we'll have a big T, big T mating with a big, a little T, little T. So when two big T's get together, they make all big T's. Um, uh, but just but approximately as often, two big T, uh, big T, big T mates with a little T, little T, and they make all heterozygotes. And so you're just as likely to, to make a bunch of homozygotes as you are to make a bunch of heterozygotes. Um, we can we'll actually have um, uh, in, uh, an optional homework question where you can work through um, and sort of prove more rigorously exactly that. Um, when two heterozygotes meet, mate together, then the expected outcome is going to be exactly in these ratios. And when homozygote mates with a heterozygote, um, since either type, since either the two dominants or two recessives are equally likely to mate with a heterozygote, um, those sort of cancel each other out as well. Um, and so, yeah, so what we get then is our population has grown, but we have. Um, 2,500 um, little t's um, and or, or, uh, homozygous recessives, and then 5,000 heterozygotes in our population. And so again, if you look at alleles, there are more alleles because there are more people, but there hasn't been any change in allele frequency. Any questions about that so far? We'll talk about other cases on Friday um, where maybe the allele frequency is not equal and what happens in that situation. Um, but for now, that's sort of the idea of evolution, or at least this is actually not evolution in a sense. This is allele frequency staying constant over time. Any questions about that? OK. Um, all right, so now we're going to have um, a different gene that we're going to be looking at in a population. Um, and again, we have two individuals that start out our population. Both of them are heterozygous for this particular gene. Um, and these are, these are um, so here we have two adults that have this particular genotype. And um, 
this gene, unlike the tasting gene, um, has a very particular sort of survival um, consequence to it, um, which is that 50% um, of, uh, of fetuses um, uh, that are A, A, or big A, little A, die before they're born. So these two got lucky and survived to be born. Then after that, no, then after that, no more. No phenotype at all for this anymore. After that, if, they, if they're lucky enough to be born, then after that, you can't tell unless you do a genetic test on them um, to figure out what genotype they are. So here we have two adults um, that are, uh, that are, um, uh, have this genotype. Um, uh, man and woman, they're going to come together and have a thousand kids, just like before. Um, and so, of those thousand kids, uh, actually, they're going to have a thousand pregnancies. Um, and um, and uh, some of the pregnancies will result in spontaneous abortions. So they're going to end up with fewer than a thousand actual live children. Um, and so, your task for now is to figure out out of those thousand pregnancies, assuming that the only thing that ever kills anybody is this spontaneous abortion um, that uh, happens with, uh, with homozygous dominant or uh, heterozygous <coughs> um, fetuses, um, what is going to be, how many people are going to survive to be born, how many kids are they going to have, and then what are the mix of genotypes of those kids that they're going to have. That makes sense. Yeah, you have a question about that. So yeah, yeah. Keep yeah. Add this on to your paper here as well. Yeah. kids are going to get born out of this scenario. Uh, yeah, sure. 125, yeah. So we have 125 AA, because 250 pregnancies had the had two dominant, but um, half of those spontaneously aborted. Um, OK, what about the, the heterozygous condition? Um, what happens there? Uh, sure, yeah. Yeah, so how many pregnancies? 500. Yeah, 500 pregnancies, half of those the baby didn't get born. Um, what about the recessive situation? Recessive trait. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so there are 250 pregnancies and they all got born. They all were born. So, um, uh, did anybody come up with an allele frequency out of this? Uh, sure, yeah. 60, 40 for recessive. That sounds about right. Is that I actually? Yeah, I yeah, that. yeah. That's okay. Yeah. So, sixty percent a, um, forty percent little a. Uh, oh, whoops. I'm sorry. That's yeah. <laughs> right. 
Uh, okay, great. So, um, has evolution happened here? Yes. yes. Our allele frequency has changed over generations. Okay, so now let's come back. Um, let's come back 20 generations from now. And um, think about what the allele frequency is likely to be 20 generations from now, um, or 50 generations, or 100 generations, or whatever. Um, uh, so so um, we've got this sort of this situation. Come back uh, many, many generations from now. Um, uh, let's just, does anyone want to throw out a guess about what they think is likely to be going on in the population at that point? Yeah. Um, because of alleles, so you yeah, I mean, depending on how long we keep this going, we're likely to end up actually pretty quickly getting to um, nearly 100% um, little a, which means everybody's going to be that. Um, uh, having a big A is really bad for your health, or at least really bad for your, um, for, for your prospects of being born. Um, and so there's a strong, and so this is what we call natural selection, right? Survival. The, in, the, the individuals don't survive if they have a big A allele. And, um, and, uh, and it may not kill everybody with the big A allele, but if it, kills a, if it kills a substantial fraction and we wait long enough, then the big A allele will decrease and decrease and approach zero in our population. Um, does that make sense kind of intuitively to everybody? Any questions about that? <coughs> okay, one more example, and this is actually all of this, if you looked ahead at the homework, this is all basically um, uh, some of the questions on the homework. So, um, all right, so one more, we've got a couple, we've got two adults, both heterozygous with B, big B and little B. Um, and the rule for this one is that 50% of fetuses that are little B, little B, die before they're born. So these two people are going to have a thousand pregnancies. The question is, what is the fraction of, what's the, the ratio of different individuals, and also what is the ratio of alleles after the, in the next generation? So go ahead and write that down on your paper as well. Work through that with your neighbors and, and uh, come back later. <laughs> Uh, and so, did anyone calculate the allele frequency here? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, that sounds about right. Something like that. So 57 percent um, uh, and 40 uh, was 43 percent. <laughs> so evolution has occurred here. There's a natural selection of survival advantage to having the dominant allele. Um, if we come back, so let's so if we compare these two. Um, if you wanted, um, uh, so so if we come back in like a million years after a thousand generations, then um, little b has a good chance of killing you if you get homo if, if you're homozygous for it. And so if we come back over a long enough time period, eventually the little bees will approach zero in our population. Um, but uh, the one does that does that make sense? First of all, any questions about that? That little bee's bad for you? Approaches zero? Yeah, sure. So wait, you need the you need the double recessive approach. Well, the the allele itself actually will because if everybody because because every time um, you you have a every time a child is conceived that is little b little b, it has a lower chance of survival, and so any parent that is that is um, carrying like any, any heterozygous parent parent. Um, is going to be if they're if they're mating with anybody else, they have a chance of having more of their children, fewer of their children survive. So as a, as a parent, if I'm a carrier for that, that's bad, and that's going to be um, 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 a, a fraction of my children are going to be at risk of dying, especially if there other if there are other little bees running around. At some point, we might get to a place where there's a couple little bees in the population, and it's at such a low frequency that it doesn't make a big uh, a big impact. Um, for example, something like Tay-Sachs disease, um, which is a recessive uh, genetic disorder, um, uh, is sort of in that situation where people with Tay-Sachs disease can't, uh, um, are, are severely handicapped and basically don't ever have children. Um, but somebody who's a carrier for Tay-Sachs disease um, is more likely than somebody who's homozygous dominant to end up with a disabled child. Um, and so um, over long enough time periods, the best genotype to have is the double dominant because all of, because we're guaranteed that all your kids are going to be healthy too. Does that kind of make sense? So it's a little bit more subtle in this case, um, but over a long enough time period, um, the little b allele will tend to decrease in frequency in our population more and more. Right? Did you have a question about that? Or? I was going to ask. So at this point, if we came back after the thousand generation, we would essentially all yeah, yeah. So after a thousand generations, yeah, we're gonna. So, um, yeah. So a thousand generations later, um, depends on the size of the population, and, and at what point we sort of randomly lose our last heterozygote. But, um, um, but we're gonna see. Um, so that's why I said sort of also here, um, nearly a hundred percent. So here we'll be at nearly a hundred percent big B. Yeah, sure. Um, is, is the, I guess, uh, the <coughs> detrimental allele going to be erased more slowly in this scenario? Yeah, well, yeah. So, um, right. Uh, so, yes, if we come back after, and, and we've sort of already seen that, but yeah, that was, that was actually kind of the next, um, the next uh, idea to think about. Um, so, um, so if we come back enough generations in the future, we'll um, basically be out of little bees. Um, but that's going to be, we have a little bit um, more, uh, the, the population's a little bit more um, uh, slow to evolve because only a fraction of people with the, with the um, uh, non-functioning disease allele actually have the phenotype that we're worried about, which is a 50% chance of dying. Um, does that kind of make sense? So, so another way to say that is, is so our, our the, the evolution the evolution is going to go a little bit faster in this population than this than our, our B population. Or our, our A allele is going to evolve faster than our B allele is. Um, but they will both evolve toward a state where the healthy allele is all is is what's basically all, entirely present in the population. Does that make sense? <clears throat> okay. All right. So. We're going to come back now. So that's that's sort of the natural selection bit. We're going to come back to our tasting and get rid of this random mating. 
And instead, only people who can taste the compound um, uh, have kids. So everybody's going out on all of their dates, bring the paper, and if your date can't taste it, then you're done. And, 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 if, you're, and if two people can't taste it, they don't want anything to do with each other either. Um, so there's just no kids at all for the non-tasters. Um, no survival advantage. But if you can't taste the stuff, you don't have kids. <laughs> so after, if we come back after you know five to ten generations, so same two questions here. Come back after five or ten generations. What do we think is going to happen to the frequency of the different alleles? And then um, uh, once, and then after five to ten generations, our population has grown a little bit. You're not going to have. There's not a precise. Actually, there, there would be a precise answer to this, but you have to solve it right now. Um, uh, just sort of, a, what would you think would be the ratios of different genotypes in our population? So just sort of like more of this, less of this, whatever. <laughs> nobody's got any genetic testing, right? So nobody's nobody's sending their stuff off to 23andMe and like figuring out who's a carrier. And um, it's all just based on the phenotype. In terms of allele frequency, there's going to be a lot of this, and then little t, almost none. Um, and um, and so in terms of our population, um, it would we have to actually sit down and sort of calculate um, what's what's expected, and it would take a little bit of time. But you would expect um, lots of big T, big T, and then a few heterozygotes and a few heterozygotes because they didn't know their partner was a heterozygote and they had a one quarter chance of having a child who would never be able to have kids themselves, um, uh, they would, uh, there would be a few people still running around who can't taste, um, uh, but, but very, very few of those, right? Does that kind of make sense intuitively? Yeah, sure. Would there be more heterozygotes than homozygotes? There would be, um, it's hard to, it's hard to say because, um, so for this, this is what's going to be on the, the, the somewhat long mathematical bonus questions, um, where you can actually work out um, over a few generations what is expected to be there. Um, I would expect that there would be um, more, that there would be about three or four times as many heterozygotes as there are homozygous non -tasters. Actually, no, it would, get, it would get pretty small pretty quickly. The homozygous non would be pretty small pretty quickly. Because um, as the allele frequency drops, the frequency of homozygotes of that allele drops as, as a function of the square of the allele frequency. Um, so, so that's actually going to drop really dramatically. So we'll have um, basically zero, like, like you know, out of our 10,000, maybe one or two homozygous like this, and then maybe, um, maybe a few hundred 
uh, maybe, you know, maybe let's just say 200 or something would be a rough guess of this. And then the rest of our 10,000 are going to be all new. Yeah. <coughs> um, we can actually, uh, that, that's, that's something that, that uh, is part of the, the homework, uh, the, the bonus homework for, for later this year. Um, yeah, other questions about this? Okay, so, so that is essentially what we mean when we talk about sexual selection, um, is um, choosing mates based on their characteristics. Um, this was, um, there, there are various ways sexual selection can play out. It can play out in terms of uh, a choice, a sort of, uh, you know, cho uh, choosing who to mate with and going over to, to mate with one individual or another. Um, sexual selection can also play out in terms of, like, when um, way back on the first day of class when we did the giraffe um, uh, material for that first homework, um, sexual selection can play out in terms of um, competition between males for mates, um, and sometimes competition between females for mates, although in most mammalian species, males um, do more visible competition. For, for, um, uh, for mates than females do. Um, uh, so, so it can play out in, in sort of a variety of different ways that way. But one way or another, um, and we're not specifying the exact mechanism of sexual selection, but whether it's mate competition, um, or uh, you know, you have to be able to taste in order to even go on a date, um, uh, or whether you, um, uh, or whether you, um, or whether it's a choice um, that's made, where like you know, if you're if you uh, if if your date can't taste something, then you can't believe that they can't taste it, and you run away and, and don't and don't want to stay with them. Uh, whether, which one of those it is, we're not specifying, but uh, sexual selection can sort of take you to form. Does that make sense? Questions about any of that? Okay, so, <coughs> next question is, if we look at this situation here, and this situation here, um, which one is going to evolve faster? So in both situations, the homozygous recessive are the ones at a disadvantage. Um, but which one's going to evolve faster? So maybe take like 10 seconds to talk, 10, 20 seconds to talk with your neighbor um, uh, and, and think about which one's going to have faster evolution. <laughs> So, so um, in terms of the ability to pass genes on to the next generation, um, our homozygous recessive, um, in, the, in this T case, have zero chance. Whereas here, they have 50% chance of surviving. And then if they do, they're going to um, uh, have as good a shot as anybody at producing, uh, at, at, having, um, uh, at having offspring in the next generation. So this is a stronger selection pressure. Um, Evolution gets a little bit more complicated than this um, because there are cases where um, individuals who are not having children can still propagate their genes by sort of um, uh, 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 familial selection um, and, and family support and so on, um, like animals that care for um, their sister's children or whatever. Um, so it's a little bit, um, uh, in reality, things get a little bit more complicated, but in sort of the stripped down, simple situation, the the, the, the sexual selection that's a hundred that's a zero percent chance of mating is a stronger evolutionary force than this fifty percent chance of dying. Does that make sense to everybody? 
Okay, so one more scenario to think about. Um, so back over here to our, again, we have our A for this, have a 50% chance of, um, of dying. Um, whereas uh, little a um, has a hundred percent, has a, I guess say zero percent chance of dying before um, before they're able to reproduce. Um, so um, so we said before that the, that the um, uh, that our population would pretty quickly reach a state where it had almost entirely or entirely made up of homozygous recessive, right? But um, uh, but things can get a little bit more complicated than that. Um, so, for example, imagine that this big A, rather than dying as, dying as a fetus, um, this, big, uh, this big A allele gives you a 50% chance um, of being eaten by a lion. Um, and then the little A, no chance of being eaten by a lion. But, um, Big A or uh, homozygous, uh, heterozygous or homozygous dominant have <coughs> higher rates of um, of reproduction, of reproductive success. And the classic example of this would be a peacock's feathers, which is this giant overgrown monstrosity of a plume that's attached to the back of a peacock, male peacock, um, that weighs it down, makes it hard to fly, makes it hard to move quickly, makes, it, makes the animal very easy for a predator to spot, um, and yet having this overgrown plume um, also enhances the animal's ability to reproduce. Um, so in that situation here with um what i guess let's would it does anybody have like um i haven't given any numbers to this um, is it obvious without any numbers in this situation in terms of how much more likely you are to reproduce um is it obvious which way evolution is going to go here is it like do you know for sure what you're going to see when you come back in 100 generations or is it kind of murky? Kind of murky. Why is it kind of murky? Does anyone want to share? Sure, yeah. Well, there are two factors that kind of would have the opposite effect. Right, yeah, yeah, exactly. So if we, if we change, we could even change this to say that, that not that they have a higher rate of reproductive success, but they're the only ones able to reproduce if they have big A, uh, if they have the dominant uh, uh, trait, um, the dominant, uh, yeah, dominant trait. Um, in which case, that would win out, um, but without giving any numbers, the point here is sort of that natural and sexual selection can work in opposition to each other, in a sense. Um, so here we have a situation where um, natural selection favors this genotype, but sexual selection favors these two genotypes. And so it's hard to predict, depending on whether the um, sexual selection force is extremely strong and no recessive, no person, uh, no peacock, whatever, who's recessive, who's homozygous recessive, is um, having offspring, um, then, <coughs> then the sexual selection force would probably win out. If lions are running around all over the place, and um, and uh, any and any um, peacock that has the dominant trait is getting eaten before they have any shot at all of reproducing, then the natural selection is going to win. Does that make sense? What questions are there? Okay. We'll come back to this a little bit um, on Wednesday and Friday. Um, and we'll finish up talking about meiosis then. Uh, remember, homework's due Wednesday. The quiz on Wednesday is class. Uh, uh, yeah, we're going on Wednesday as well.